thank you very much uh, and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to today's launch of the OECD Economic Outlook here together with our chief economist, Laurence Boone. Uh, Laurence will present the detailed uh, projections, but let me just outline for you what we see as the pressing macroeconomic challenges today. Uh, the global recovery continues to progress. Uh, GDP in most countries is now close to the pre-pandemic path. Uh, massive fiscal and monetary policy support to households and firms from the outset of the crisis, the relatively rapid development of vaccines, the accelerating digital transformation in the wake of the pandemic have all helped uh, get us into this position. But the growth momentum is slowing uh, and disparities in the recovery remain. Not every country, industry or community is recovering at the same pace. Uh, tackling the COVID-19 pandemic around the world remains our most urgent priority. Whilst the threat of infection remains high, we remain vulnerable, which is why we must continue to be vigilant in responding to any new infection outbreaks which can undermine the recovery both globally and regionally. Uh, we see this risk here in Europe where a new wave of infections has been sweeping through the continent and where the rollout of vaccinations, very strong in many parts, has been too low in others. Uh, global vaccination rates in aggregate have increased substantially over the last six months. Uh, today, about 42% of the world is fully vaccinated compared to just 5% or thereabout, uh, thereabouts back in May. But the vaccination coverage remains too uneven, in particular across developing countries, but also across parts of Europe. We need to continue to pursue an all-out effort to reach the entire world population with vaccines as quickly as possible. Because no country will be properly protected until every country is more properly protected. The recent emergence of the new Omicron variant provides us with yet another stark reminder of that fact. Uh, the lags in vaccination rights are also contributing to a supply crisis which is disrupting the global economy. How did we get here? Uh, prior to the pandemic, global supply chains were operating smoothly, even if some risks were looming, for example, due to underinvestment or heavy concentration of some supply chain components in particular regions. When the impact of COVID-19 started to hit in early 2020, Economies slow to restrict the spread of the virus, creating millions of small disruptions and interruptions. Restrictions and quarantine requirements brought down demand as well as production. But once economies started to reopen, demand rebounded strongly. Resurging demand faced severe supply disruptions, which of course caused this supply-demand mismatch. World merchandise trade and retail sales are already above their 2019 levels and oil demand is close uh, to its pre-pandemic level. But supply bottlenecks persist, triggered by labor shortages, intermittent plant closures and shipping delays. And these disruptions directly affect the availability and the prices of everyday goods. The global food prices, for example, have continued to climb, hitting a 10-year high this October. These high food prices are felt by everyone, but especially by lower income households who spend a larger share of their income on food. The supply of electronic goods, everyday appliances and vehicles has also been affected with a global semiconductor chip shortage delaying production. Disruptions have also increased the cost of energy. Restrictions on the transportation and supply of oil and gas combined with weather-related events, draining inventories, have added upward pressure on global energy prices. Geopolitical tensions are high as economies across the globe are searching for reliable, predictable and more environmentally sustainable sources of energy. 
While we expect inflationary pressures to start fading in the new year, we must not forget that it will be the consumer who bears the cost if shortages persist and prices remain high. Policymakers will need to continue to address health, supply, and energy challenges to optimize and strengthen the quality of the global recovery across countries, sectors, firms, and households. And with this, I now pass the floor to our Chief Economist, Laurence Boon. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Um, so I, as we all know, we, we've been witnessing a brisk, but obviously unsteady recovery since the middle of 2020. And that's due to the persistent threat from COVID. There's also a variety of imbalances, uh, as Matthias was mentioning, between and within countries, between supply and demand, and in the labor and in energy markets, um, which have emerged. So today, as we present our new economic outlook, we, we are concerned actually that the new variant of the virus, the Omicron strain, is further adding to the already high levels of uncertainty and risks, and that could be a threat to the recovery. So with this in mind, I'll be talking you through our outlook for 2022 and 2023, and I will uh, give you our, what we think are important policy messages to sustain the recovery. So with the continuous and fiscal monetary support across the world, and as vaccination rates continue to rise, the global economy will continue its recovery. And growth will gradually return to its pre-pandemic rates, which is shown here by the red dashed line after the fast rebound experience since the mid-20s, since mid-20. So the, this recovery really means that world GDP is on its way to returning to its pre-pandemic path by the end of 2023. But um, as, as you know, with Omicron, we remain cautiously optimistic uh, and we're alarmed by the risk and challenges this outlook faces. So I think the first striking feature, which is important, uh, is the imbalance recovery. And that's the fact, which is illustrated here, that countries are recovering at different paces. As you can see on the, on the left, uh, which shows the evolution of employment, Europe, which is in blue, has been focusing on protecting jobs throughout the crisis. And as a result, employment is now already at its pre-crisis level. Whereas on the right, which shows the evolution of GDP, we can see that GDP in the US in red fell less, fell less sorry, and return to its pre-pandemic level faster than in the Euro area. So in the US, policy has been largely focusing on supporting households' incomes rather than jobs. And that's a very good illustration of the differences across policy approaches. And if in case of shocks, in case of a renewed shock to demand, in Europe, it would be output that is hurt more while in the US, jobs would take the hit. In emerging market economies, uh, if we exclude China and India, um, what's worrying us is we are seeing signs of slower catch up. And by that, I mean that the gap between advanced and emerging economies, which, which had been reducing until 2014, is now actually widening. And to put things clearly, that means standards of living in emerging market economies are further falling behind. And one of the concerns we have now is that if another outbreak would lead to, which would lead to more border closures, would hurt emerging and developing countries even further. But let me now, um, let's now take a look at some of the details of our GDP projections for the world and for the G20. So there, there's been, as I was saying, a strong rebound in the global economy of 5.6% in 2021. And growth, we project growth will be moderating to 4.5% in 2022, 
And returning to a, a more normal, or, or I should say usual, 3.2% in 2023, because the boost from reopening and the massive policy support uh, will normalize. But I think it's important that we share our concerns with you all. And a key threat is obviously the health situation, whether it's Delta, Omicron, or other variants of the virus that might emerge. And I'll come back to the threats arising from the health situation after I've discussed the economic imbalances with you. Um, because the economic imbalances make us much more vulnerable to the consequences of another outbreak. So let's start with energy. What we're seeing here on the left-hand side is how oil and especially gas prices have surged. And there are many reasons for this the weather to start with, but also delayed maintenance of infrastructure during lockdowns. There also has been less infrastructure development uh, in fossil fuel. For example, the 2011 and 2014 decline in oil prices led to less investment uh, in, in those fossil fuels, which is not surprising. But at the same time, investment in clean energy infrastructure has also not increased, and which is a little more surprising. <clears throat> so um, we're very concerned that these higher prices, volatile price movement could persist over the winter because gas inventories are, are low. And that's the case particularly in Europe. What the right hand side chart shows is that gas storage levels across Europe are about 28% lower than what they were two years ago. And what this means is if the winter is, is long or particularly cold, um, there are risks not only of further price increases, but even of outages. Now, on, on top of these energy imbalances, uh, we are really concerned that persisting supply tensions in manufacturing sectors will continue to fall inflation. First, you know, high energy prices and fuel shortages have been directly limiting the manufacture of key materials and equipment. And when we combine this with other supply bottlenecks in metal production, shipping, containers, the impact of sanitary procedures on ports, the time that manufacturers have to wait for input has dramatically increased, as we can see on the left-hand side. We can also see that it's uh, also related to the pressure from demand, um, because advanced economies uh, are more affected by this higher delivery time, and they had been rebounding much higher than emerging market economies. Now, Obviously, this difficulty in getting input uh, is not only fueling inflation, but it's not only lengthening delay, but it's also limiting productions. And an increasing number of firms are reporting they've been limiting production because of these shortages, which is what we can see on the right hand side. Um, and that could be even more important as outbreaks of the virus rise in some regions and uh, together with the additional uncertainty that's created by the new variant. Now, le let me give you a concrete example of this with the car industry. Um, and the car industry for memory represents about 3% of global output. So for cars, chips are, are very critical. I mean, the chips are critical for many parts of our economies. And, but today, lack of chips is massive. And delivery times have jumped from an average of 13 to 22 weeks, which is what you can see on the left. Now, about 10% of all semiconductors are sold to car makers. And some cars need up to 3,000 different chips. Um, so you can easily see that without chips, we're going to get a lot fewer cars. So we've done some analysis to estimate the fall in production resulting from these shortages. And this analysis suggests that they're large enough to have marked effect on the overall recovery in some countries. On the right-hand side chart, you can see that GDP uh, in some countries especially Germany or Mexico, the Czech Republic and Japan, 
have been markedly reduced by supply disruption and falling production in the motor vehicle industry. And we're increasingly concerned that if this tension persists, if these imbalances persist, uh, we'll continue to have some downward pressure on production, growth, and prices. And I think that that brings me to the fact that it's fair to say that all these imbalances have been persisting for longer than expected. Um, and as a result, which is what you see on this chart, we've been pushing our inflation projections higher and further into the future. And we're expecting them to stabilize at a more elevated level than pre-crisis by 2023. So the, the orange line here was our December 2020 projections that the flat line at the bottom. The red was May this year, the green was September, and we're now projecting the blue line. So assuming the health situation improves, which, which is our central scenario, as production expands and as demand becomes more balanced, we're expecting those bottlenecks and imbalances to diminish and inflation pressure to reduce. But we, can, we cannot really ignore the risk that new outbreaks, new variants, persistent imbalances in vaccination levels, and between demand and constrained supply could prolong higher levels of inflation and continue to weigh on a household's income and consumption. Now, let, let me share an additional imbalance we're concerned about, and, and that's in the labor market. What we can see here is the pandemic has caused a lot of disruption in the labor market. On the left, um, people are not working as much as before, even when jobs have been preserved. The number of housework is still well below pre-crisis levels in most countries. And at the same time, on the right, many businesses are struggling to find workers. So that reflects three things. First, the uncertainty with the health situation. Some people may be reluctant to go back to work. Second, there are difficult adjustments in the labor market. The jobs and skills which are demanded today are not necessarily the same as before the COVID crisis. So people are struggling to find new jobs. And companies at the same time are struggling to find the people they need to fill the vacancies. And I think a third element uh, is worth mentioning. It is that the closure of international borders has hit international migration. And many countries reliant on cross-border inflows into the labor force, whether from permanent migration or just seasonal workers, are now experiencing labor shortages. Without, and I'm going to repeat it many times, without more effective government actions on health and vaccination, but also on childcare in some countries, and to help people reskill and find new jobs, these job market imbalances could persist they could lead to tensions in production chains becoming more entrenched. Now to close the risk section, let me uh, share with you why we are concerned about the slowdown in China. As we all know before the pandemic, China accounted for roughly one third of global growth. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we've all been reading about imbalances there. So what we're showing uh, here on the left is how a further slowdown in China, so something additional to our projections, uh, where demand growth would be reduced two percentage points per annum over the next couple of years, could actually reduce global GDP growth by up to one percentage point in 2022 and 2023. Why? First trade with China would slow new disruption to supply chains could appear, and financial market would very likely be particularly shaken by such a shock. So you can see how the major OECD economies on the right-hand side would lose uh, between about 1.5 and 2% of growth over two years. So now that we've listed the imbalances, I guess we should discuss what governments may do uh, about this. Um, and that brings me, uh, obviously, with the health situation. So I think it, 
You know, we're currently living through a period of very high uncertainty. There's renewed strong outbreaks of the virus in some regions, including here. New variants are continuing to emerge. And many uh, low-income countries around the world lag behind in vaccination, which is on the left. But what the chart on the right shows is that even within advanced economies, some countries continue to have extremely low vaccination rates. So simply, vaccinating more people, ensuring they are double or even triple vaxxed, remain the most important priority for ending the pandemic and also for tackling the imbalances that are plaguing the recovery. Otherwise, livelihoods will continue to be hit hard and will continue to witness suffering, hardship and loss of life. And today's uncertainty with another new variant is a very harsh reminder that the job is not done. Let, let me say something simple. Um, the G20 countries have spent $10 trillion supporting people and their economies since the beginning of the pandemic. It would only take $50 billion to ensure vaccination worldwide. I'm just saying. And if we don't vaccinate everyone everywhere, the supply tensions, bottlenecks, all the imbalances I've just been talking about will also continue to persist, including higher inflation, which will undermine people purchasing power. And that brings me to inflation and the question that's on everybody's mind, which is what should central banks do? So in the US, uh, the Fed has already begun to act and you see US inflation on the, on the left and it will continue to do so. And several countries have, have done the same. But in most countries, central banks have been waiting for supply tensions to diminish and rightly so. Faced with supply bottlenecks and where overall demand is not excessive, the best central banks can do is actually to signal that they will act if the pressure continues to increase. But it is for companies and governments to address the bottlenecks. And that brings me to public finance and investment. So we are concerned. We are concerned about the use of borrowing. As the chart shows, the COVID crisis has increased debt levels. And as I've mentioned before, this was appropriate in the crisis. So the COVID debt is not the concern in itself, but rather the rising trend in debt over decades. And as the recovery progresses, the issue now is what are governments doing with this money? Are they taking stock of how to address missing months of children's education and putting mentoring in place to help them catch up? Are they revamping their healthcare systems, staff working condition? making sure hospitals will be able to cope with various variants? Are they implementing digitalization strategies? Are they upgrading their services, the infrastructures? Are they equipping people with the right skills for the transition? Good debt is the debt that supports productive investment and that will raise potential growth level. And to that, we have not been seeing much of that. So, we're urging governments not to tighten, but to shift the composition of spending and plan to make sure their debt will be good debt, not bad debt. And that is particularly relevant to climate change, which is the last topic I want to address today. The whole world came together in Glasgow last month for urgent discussions on the climate crisis. Governments have been very long on announcing their ambitions to address climate change, but many have fallen quite short on implementing specific actions to deliver on their targets. So to meet these ambitions, the International Energy Agency here at the OECD has estimated that investment in the clean energy transition must increase from current levels to over three trillions per year by 2030 which is shown on the left. Now, most of this investment can come from the private sector. But certainty for that to materialize, certainty in the form of detailed plan for tax policies, regulations, 
and some public investment, especially in networks and grids, are, very, are crucial. And that's what we show on the right-hand side. So, so here again, I think it, it is very high time for more coordination and multilateral discussion to accelerate the, the energy transition in a way that is globally efficient. So to sum up, <coughs> vaccines have been discovered, approved, and launched in record time. And as a result, the recovery to date has been faster than expected. But it would be a big mistake to believe the job has been or is almost done. We are very concerned that many lessons have not been learned from recent experiences. And the news about the Omicron variant uh, may actually be a reminder of how short-sighted that failure has been. We're spending to support our economies while we're failing to vaccinate the whole world. We're still not fully seizing the opportunity to implement changes in our approaches to education, health, climate, and more largely the use of public money. As a result, um, the world is not really looking better. Thank you. We'll turn to questions in the room first. Uh, there's a question from AFP. Yes, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Ali Bekovic for AFP. Uh, maybe two questions. The first one would be uh, the US president called last week for waivers, a waiver on patents for vaccines, uh, since uh, this study is calling for a rise in vaccination rates. Uh, very quickly, do you call for this waiver uh, at the OECD? Uh, and second question uh, about the new strain of the, of the uh, COVID-19 variant. Um, the CEO of Moderna said yesterday that the vaccine, we don't really know exactly now how the vaccine is going to respond to this variant, but uh, do you see it as a short-term uh, disruption for the global economy, or do you see this as a threat, a more durable threat? Thank you. So on, on the vaccine and the delivery of vaccine to, um, uh, to the world, I think there are two things to keep in mind is uh, the production is soon reaching 1.5 billion a month. The, the big question today is how do we deploy vaccines? How do we bring vaccine to everybody in the world? So it's a logistic question um, more than, than anything at this stage. And what we're very concerned is that this logistic is not materializing. Um, and the second question on, on the threat, um, two things here. We don't know, right? I mean, we've, we've included this uncertainty into the outlook, which is why we focus so much on imbalances, because we know that this could be happening given the state of vaccination in the world. Um, so there could be two options. One is this is a variant like we've seen um, since the beginning of the crisis and, and it's going to be a tough winter and it's pushing back a little uh, the, the, the recovery, but it's not disrupting it. But we see more tensions, more supply tensions, and it's worsening the balances uh, I've been mentioning. Um, but it will, will eventually, because fundamentals are strong, get back to where we are in these projections. Now, there's another uh, scenario, which is that it's, it's worse, um, and, and we, we, have to, um, we have to protect ourselves much better. In that case, you know, we've been learning um, better how to live with the virus, wearing masks, maintaining contact distancing. Demand could be hurt and, and would slow, but that would also bring uh, price pressure down as well. Um, and some police support at this stage may be demanded. A question from Effie. Je peux la passer en français? Ouais. Can I ask this question in, in, in French? The same question, a new variant, really. And how did you include it in your forecasts, in your outlook? Uh, in the central uh, scenario, uh, do you have uh, a key focus on that new uh, variant? And I had another question on Spain because there was a significant uh, change in its uh, forecast uh, compared to what you would uh, forecast in September. Uh, beyond the technical uh, issue of uh, the 
problem of the uh, Spanish National Institute for Statistics, we saw that Spain, that was one of the countries that had seven most last year in the uh, downfall of its uh, economy, well, this year might be one of the countries growing most. Uh, with the uh, greatest uh, growth, like the UK or like uh, Argentina. But apparently it's not going to be the case. So could you uh, explain why it didn't work and uh, why, why things went so badly? Especially there's a significant uh, difference between your uh, forecast and the forecast that is maintained by the uh, Spanish government. Do you have an explanation on that? Thank you very much. Well, on the variant, first of all. This, these are forecasts we make uh, for six to eight weeks, and these forecasts are focused on the uncertainties coming from the possibility of new variants, the persistence of the virus, what we saw coming. That's why you have such a large chunk of the uh, outlook focusing on risks and imbalances. With Omicron, there is new added uncertainties. No one quite knows much about that new uh, variant, but this adds to the level of uncertainty. And in terms of forecasting, this uh, aggravates the risks we have already identified, whether it be uh, tensions on uh, supply or production uh, chains with closed borders, with health checks uh, reinforced, and this might uh, also um, put more pressure on uh, demand for uh, semiconductors, tablets, cars, chips, etc. Uh, and it can also uh, mean that we might have a longer, harsher uh, winter with higher inflation uh, that could last a little uh, longer. There's another thing that we should also keep in uh, mind, and this is precisely why we wanted to understand all of these uncertainties, is that this virus might be more evil. And should it be uh, the case, uh, we've learned uh, to live uh, with it. We know how to wear masks. We know how to work uh, remotely from home. Uh, we are the living proof uh, thereof. And um, indeed, this might uh, impact the trust or confidence of uh, households, of firms. Demand might go down. And if demand goes down, prices and inflation might go down quite dramatically. So that's why we insist on the risks. And the best thing to do, again, and this is what we've highlighted, there are risks. What's the best policy facing those risks is to vaccinate, to limit, reduce those risks. That's for Omicron. For Spain now, I'm quite sure that you will agree that over that period, measuring changes in inflation, GDP, etc., is extremely challenging. That's why in the economic outlook, everything is uh, framed and we measure inflation on the one hand. But in the previous edition, we also had a box on the uh, GDP measuring uh, measure differences between different countries. And uh, let me give you an example. You might remember um, how do we measure production of professors, of uh, teachers, in uh, different national education uh, systems. Well, in some countries, that is measured based on the wages paid out. In other countries, that's uh, measured based on the number of hours worked. So during the uh, crisis, those who paid uh, those wages out, I mean, the production didn't move. But those who based out on the number of hours worked saw that production falling down. So we have to take all of these comparisons between countries with a pinch of salt. There are several factors beyond what you mentioned which can, which can explain uh, why uh, GDP uh, might be uh, reviewed. First of all, there's quite a few uh, small companies which are strongly impacted by uh, delays in uh, deliveries. Also, there's the importance of the uh, real estate uh, sector and of uh, the construction sector, which is highly uh, disturbed in that period. The importance of tourism, despite this uh, stark rebound we had uh, last summer. And there's also the uh, disruption on job matching with people who might be looking for jobs that no longer exist because we're still going through a crisis and there are limited services uh, on the offer, and other people who don't have the right qualifications but who are still protected by um, support for uh, unemployment. Now, so Spain is rebounding. Uh, recovering, uh, employment is uh, recovering. Uh, we monitor that everywhere, but we should not extrapolate too much. Questions on inflation. Um, 
the Fed chair yesterday uh, said the word transitory should be removed. Um, what's your view on that? I have banned the word transitory from the economic outlook this line, so I guess we're, we're in line for this. Um, look, I think there, there are two things. One is effectively we, and we've shown this in the economic outlook, you know, we keep revising upward and longer the inflation pressure. Um, and in some countries, it's mostly due to the supply disruption, but that, that's 10 months uh, that I, this has been going on, so, so we have to be careful and to monitor clearly um, and keep that in mind if if you know the situation uh, the health situation deteriorates we will see or prolong we'll see how that evolves I think what's very important when when we think about this and we've been recommending is that central banks first their their life and job is difficult at the moment but what we require from them is clear communication that they explain where they stand, that they explain where they want to go, depending on the state, on the economy, depending on the data that comes and the way they affect their projections. I guess the other point uh, to make is that up until this point, uh, the uh, inflation outlook in the US was uh, somewhat different to the inflation outlook uh, in the euro area. And so, um, you know, clearly the um, Fed and Mr. Powell make uh, reflections in relation to the outlook specifically for the US, uh, but as uh, Laurence uh, previously explained, I mean, there is a marked difference between the situation in the US and in the Euro area. I will turn to a question from Tim Wallace, uh, The Telegraph in the UK. Please, can you tell me why you have upgraded the UK GDP forecast for 2021, even as you have cut the forecasts for the US, the Eurozone, and China? So most of the revisions which are in this economic outlook come from the publication of uh, quarterly data. Um, so it's from history. It's not us making, uh, making um, uh, speculation about the future. So in effect, the path to the recovery both in the US and the UK has barely moved. A question from Assis Moreira of uh, Valor Economico in Brazil. Um, the report mentions in Brazil higher interest rates and policy uncertainty. Would you say the pace of recovery is slowing in Brazil much more because of internal factors than for external factors uh, like China? And what to expect in terms of inflation in Latin America and Brazil in 2022? Um, so Brazil is, is if one of the countries where inflation has, uh, has gone up quite fast. Um, partly because of the tensions we've described, uh, partly because of food prices as well, partly because of the weather disrupting energy production. Um, so the central banks has reacted and fairly quickly, and uh, obviously that will allow to address inflation. Um, it may take more time, you know, the path through of central bank actions into uh, economic activity and prices is usually between nine months to one year or a little more. Uh, there's a question from uh, Kevin uh, Claire, who's an agricultural reporter. Uh, bonjour, uh, croyez-vous au... Hello. Do you believe in the super bull cycle of raw materials, including uh, grains, cereals? As Goldman Sachs suggested in a study published at the end of 2020. Well, there's one thing we saw, that's the uh, increase, the hike in the price of... Uh, uh, raw materials in uh, energy, agriculture, uh, wheat in particular because of the weather conditions in Canada. And this indeed can create tensions on food. One of the reasons why we insist on those uh, tensions, whether it be uh, food or energy or transport, is that the uh, consumption basket of any household is made up of food energy to heat the house and to move, travel, and um, your, your, the price you pay for your house. And these are the three uh, items on which households can anticipate a hike in prices. And this is where uh, there might be uh, inflationary uh, pressures, where we may anticipate inflation to go up. This is something we need to follow very, to monitor very closely. Why you have cut growth forecasts for China and the US? Sorry, why we have put what? Why you have cut growth forecasts for China and the US? 
So for, for the US, I think I've answered. It's mostly, um, it's mostly historical data. And, and by the way, for the record, we've included the infrastructure bill uh, in China, in the US, sorry. Um, so we have not downgraded it. It's the same projection by the end of the period. For China, uh, there's much less support than there was before, and also much less rebound. So China is returning to its 5% uh, growth target um, in 2022 and 2023. One thing about China is, is we're really highlighting some of the imbalances. Um, and obviously, China is very big in the world economy, right? It's, uh, it's one of the largest exporter, one of the largest consumer of commodities. Um, and, and if China, when China slows down that quickly, um, then it has an impact on, on demand addressed to the rest of the world. So we, we have to be careful of what ha what's happening with China. Richard Partington from The Guardian in the UK. Um, could Omicron lead to a falling global GDP from your 4.5% forecast in 22? You say Omicron could fuel uh, higher and more persistent inflation. But could it also affect demand? Could the impact from Omicron be that demand is more heavily affected than supply? I actually have laid out two scenarios. One is where it creates more supply disruptions and prolongs higher uh, inflation for longer. And one where it's more severe and, and we have to use you know, more mobility restrictions, in which case demand could decline and then inflation could actually recede much faster than what we have here. And, and that could even be a scenario where we would need more fiscal support at this stage. If there are, there are no more questions, we have one more question coming through on the chat. Okay, uh, it's a follow-up question on, 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 on Spain uh, from uh, the Radio Nacional. Est-ce que la grande révision... Revising the growth perspective down two points compared to September, is that also because the Statistical Institute of Spain revised its figures on growth for the second quarter of 2021? It's just a question on a Spanish economy. Yes, uh, indeed, for quite a few uh, countries, there were uh, figures were revised down uh, for the second and the third quarters. And usually when everything is revised down, then there is a, a resurgence uh, of the virus. And when uh, this uh, viral uh, outbreak, virus outbreak uh, stops, then there is a rebalance. So it's between uh, quarters, but overall the path, the strength of the recovery has not changed. Thank you very much for your... Uh, I'd just like to remind everybody there's a wealth of material on the website, graphs and data. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. Nice team. Thank you. That was really good.